for those of you uh, sort of unfamiliar with me a little bit, as I haven't obviously been uh, as much exposure in uh, books as Debbie and uh, certain other people, and obviously Paul's written prolifically on Psychic Questing now, I thought I'd just go into a little bit about how I ended up doing uh, the form of the land ritual for uh, all of those years during the 1990s, how I actually got to that point um, and uh, discovered uh, Andrew's work. Um, and that, like a lot of people, was through this book here, uh, The Black Alchemist, uh, which came out in 1988. Um, I didn't know about the book, but it was uh, a normal family Christmas in 1988. It was round uh, my parents' house at the time. And uh, my cousin Paul, who's a couple of years younger than I, but also very, very interested in uh, psychic matters and the supernatural and things like this, it's an interest we shared and uh, still share to this day, uh, gave me a Christmas present. And I opened it up and it was this book. And uh, basically, um, instead of being social like I should have been over that Christmas and chatting to all of the family and doing lots of stuff, all I wanted to do was go and lock myself in the other room and read this thing because I'd never picked up a book like it that really, really sort of gripped me and made me want to read on to the next bit and find out what happened. Um, I'd already by that time had quite a sort of a grounding for about probably best part of 10 years uh, since my early teens in sort of various occult philosophies that I'd read about magic and things like this. But uh, this was something completely different. Psychic questing was something I really didn't know a lot about. Uh, so after reading the book, um, in 1989, uh, my cousin pointed out, my cousin Paul again, pointed out the fact that uh, Andrew was putting on uh, an event at the Cramphorn Theatre in Chelmsford in Essex, uh, not that far from where uh, we both lived. So we decided to go along to this and uh, he was also had another friend of his, Julie, come along from work who said, oh yes, I know Andrew, I've met him before, you know, I'll introduce you and all the rest of this and we thought, oh, this would be great. So. Uh, we're standing in the queue with everyone else waiting to go into the theatre and uh, Julie spots Andrew coming along. Oh, there's Andrew, yeah, yeah, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. And she's waving at him and uh, expecting some sort of reply, which unfortunately all that came was, oh, I'm sorry, do I know you? Um, to which crestfallen, she sort of like went very, very quiet and uh, didn't mention it again. And uh, we ended up going in, learning a lot more about the background of the, uh, of the Black Alchemist uh, uh, book. Uh, and off the back of that, in 1990, um, I started uh, regularly attending Andrew's EarthQuest meetings uh, in the ship pub in Leon C, um, which happened uh, once a month, I think it was, and I, I think it was a Monday night, but you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and during these, he would talk about lots of different landscape mysteries, sort of local mysteries, folklore and things like this. And one thing which was common to all of these uh, evenings, the second part would always be what he initially referred to as a meditation on whichever theme we were working on that night. And uh, again, this, although I'd had some experience of meditation, this was more of a what I'd call creative visualisation in that it was a very, very sort of deep meditation in which was guided and you would then start seeing things and obviously have a period of time where you would actually go off on your own and interact with whatever sort of uh, paradigm or landscape uh, that Andrew had uh, taken us to. Um, and uh, then he also did some uh, uh, psychical dayas again, which I was fascinated by this concept of this creative visualisation and some of the exercises he was giving us to do still do my head in when I think about them today, about sort of how to visualise opening a matchbox and going inside it and then closing the matchbox with you inside, doing all the absolutely messed my head up in, in, in some ways, but uh, was, was a great grounding for what, what would come. Um, and then I started to have, which I hadn't really had before, sort of what I'd call psychic dreams. And uh, one of these uh, was about a stone, um, a stone circle in Dorset, which uh, you can see here. Um, this is the Repstone Stone Circle uh, on the Isle of Purbeck in Dorset. And I had this strange dream that um, I could see people there doing something, some kind of ritual which I felt was suspect. 
and I could see a large ball of flint which appeared like a throbbing egg which they seemed to be powering up and at some point I felt was going to sort of open and unleash something, you know, sort of uh, untoward into the landscape. Um, so one of the questing maxims uh, which I'd been taught by Andrew was go with the flow and if you pick something up, go and check it out. So I thought, okay, fair enough, let's do that. I've got a car. Um, I spoke to uh, a friend of mine, very talented psychic, Sean York, um, and we ended up going down to the Repstone Stone Circle to find out what was going on. And as soon as we got there, um, I could see this... Uh, <laughs> strange person crawling in front of me. No, no, no. Um, I could see, see this uh, piece of flint at the back of the stones that had been broken open. Um, it got some symbols on the stone, it got some wax on it, and what looked like a small Celtic chess piece stuck onto this uh, stone. And so uh, we decided, uh, after doing a meditation, Sean and I, that we should remove this from the site because it was uh, mucking up the energies we felt. And uh, that led on to um, a whole series of sites which we went round on the Isle of Purbeck, um, uh, literally, you know, looking round, following up, following up this quest. Um, and as I say, I continued uh, after this, I was obviously told Andrew about this, and uh, for me it was like my first artefact that I'd found. I'd obviously heard about, you know, sort of finding artefacts from obviously, you know, the Black Alchemist and things like this, but this was the first one I actually found myself. Um, and then, a little while later, after working with Andrew for a while, um, he hands me a copy of this booklet here. Um, the Heart of the Rose, um, prepared by the Council of the Rose, which uh, basically is uh, Mr. Andrew Collins at the time. Um, and uh, that he, it was published in 1989, but not published in the sense that it was widely distributed like his other books. This was something a little bit more private. And uh, this talked about the whole uh, concept of uh, the Heart of the Rose and the linking between the king and the land and sort of it was linked with uh, the legends of King Arthur and the Seven Swords of Destiny, something which uh, would be brought together at some point at the heart of the rose by Arthur and his round table knights and there were clues to this in various paintings and tapestries uh, of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, particularly this one uh, which is um, uh, Edward Byrne Jones's tapestry of the Heart of the Rose, otherwise known as the Pilgrim in the Garden. And uh, this here, as you can see, shows uh, a, a woman there in, in a rose uh, with somebody obviously uh, uh, contemplating. Um, and uh, then the next uh, I knew about uh, the Heart of the Rose was when the Seventh Sword came out in 1991. The book, that is, not the sword itself. Uh, which obviously you can see the cover of here. Um, now within the Seventh Sword, um, there was a fair bit of information coming out which was relating uh, to Mary Heath, um, particularly from uh, Graham Phillips, um, in which he was talking about a ritual which uh, the seven inner members of the Myanmar group were to perform at a mysterious location called the Heart of the Rose and that they were going to do this in order to usher in a new golden age and uh, sort of prevent anything bad happening. Now, um, this ritual, for uh, reasons which uh, I probably won't go into now, but uh, according to Psychic Information, didn't actually happen. Um, but uh, also, the Heart of the Rose was alluded to in the book, but. Uh, at the time, it was thought to be somewhere in the Midlands, and all they knew about it was that it was marked by uh, a single tree with a cave structure below and a prominent hill. Um, now, Graham and Grainer, sorry, Graham and Gainer, uh, this is Gainer S uh, Sunderland, um, who you've heard about before today, um, referred to this place as One Tree Hill, but again, it wasn't uh, pinned down where it actually was. Um, but what did come out was the fact that Graham thought that in, at some point in modern times this ritual would have to be performed. 
And this was also concer uh, confirmed by uh, the psychic Bernard, um, who Andrew worked with, obviously, on the Black Alchemist saga for many, many years, uh, and it's now sadly passed. Um, and he also said that, yes, this ritual will happen, but not in the way you think, he said, but it will be after the finding of the Seventh Sword, which, of course, at the time of the publication of... of uh, of the book uh, was known to be out there but wasn't actually found. I mean, in the book itself, as many of you probably know, there was even instructions on how you can get involved uh, to help find the Seventh Sword. And then, bizarrely enough, it turned up in an antique shop at, at the end of uh, Andrew's Road where he was living at the time in Leon C, um, which is just, just, just crazy. Uh, but anyway, back to the, uh, the Heart of the Rose itself. Um, The Heart of the Rose is, is kind is, uh, or, or rather, um, uh, White Leafed Oak, which uh, is the, the place now identified as the Heart of the Rose, was uh, talked about a lot by uh, a, uh, Earth Mysteries researcher, a friend of ours, John Merrin, who in the mid-80s uh, went round and identified all of the sites of uh, the Circle of Perpetual Choirs, as it's known, which was spoken about by, first of all, by John Michel in his book, uh, City of Revelation, which came out in 1972. Um, now, the interesting thing about the uh, Circle of Perpetual Choirs is, and what John Merrin found out was, that one of the sites uh, that forms on the edge of the circle is Brick Hill Woods, where obviously uh, Colin uh, and Jelly Padden um, found uh, their two swords. And uh, after... Um, he actually found these swords. He was in a bit of a daze and sort of wandered off into some other clearing and was drawn to some large prominent tree. And sort of after linking with this, again, he was told, and this was, the, I think, the first time this came out, that uh, the seven swords would all come together and again confirmed that, you know, something big was going to happen when, uh, when this occurred. Um, this uh, um, went on to, uh, when Andrew heard about this, he managed to make the link, thinking, OK, we've got a place with a big tree here, a prominent hill, uh, looked at the circle of perpetual choirs, um, and lo and behold, um, white leaf oak uh, sort of leapt to the fore, and uh, that, that was the, the place identified as the heart of the rose. Sorry, excuse me a sec. Now, John, uh, John Michel's um, Circle of Perpetual Choirs basically is a circle of ten sites which he saw as perpetual choirs. Now, these sort of choirs, or druidic choirs rather, were sort of first mentioned in 1796 by a guy called um, Iolo Morgan, who was uh, a kind of a druid revivalist and sort of was one of the people sort of mainly responsible for the sort of 19th century uh, Druid revival and talked about these, each choir having 2,400 saints praising God. So obviously you have now White Leaf Oak, which has got its prominent hill, it's actually got, it's actually got two, uh, Ragged Stone Hill and um, Chase End Hill, the latter which I'll come on to again later as that is one of the sites we used. Um, and obviously uh, a famous oak there, which although the original one I think was lost in a storm, this particular strain of white-leafed oak uh, is still uh, there today. And incidentally, in recent years, so just to make it even more strange, um, we found uh, through Graham's uh, information that um, there's actually a white-leafed oak in Bidolf Grange Gardens, which may have been taken there by... Um, uh, James Bateman himself, potentially. Um, but uh, White Leafed Oak certainly is a very, very strange and mystical place. It is, it is almost like a centre of, uh, of, a mystical centre of England. Um, and uh, also recently as well, I think it was Paul Weston found out that um, Brigham Young, one of the uh, founding fathers of Mormons, uh, uh, established the first Mormon church there at White Leaf Oak as well, for reasons we don't really understand. But clearly, it's one of those places that is sort of call, calling out to various people. Uh, now, 
The first uh, modern form of the lamb ritual um, took place in 1992. Um, I didn't join in, in this until 1993, but this is a... Uh, a picture of uh, you know I'm sure many of the people there you can you can recognise even though they're obviously uh, considerably younger there than they are now, um, but uh, this was to be the original ritual that was kind of thought that the uh, Me and I group the original Me and I group and Mary Heath were going to perform was something kind of Templar based sort of a little bit Masonic, a little bit Kabbalistic, and uh, the original sort of um, uh, modern incarnation kind of built upon these principles, but it was something which was more stripped down to the concepts of pure colour, light and sound, even though it was roughly Judeo-Christian in its basis. Um, and something else which I find quite fascinating as well is, is the backgrounds of the people that took place in this. Um, that we had Mormons, we had Thelemites, we had Buddhists, we had a chaos magician, we had a druid. It was, it's like psychic questing does not have any kind of, it doesn't differentiate. It's not a religious system which says, you know, if you don't worship Allah or you don't worship God or Vishnu or whoever it is, you can't be part of it, which uh, I think is a great thing personally. Um, and it was decided that obviously the Seven Swords would uh, be brought together and taken to various sites which kind of, and each sword was assigned a colour. Uh, which was approximately based on the lower seven um, spheres of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. So you had green representing uh, Netzar, and that was the Meaniah sword. You had orange representing Hod, which was the Tintagel sword. And certain of these, obviously, you can see over there uh, on the exhibition uh, uh, a stall. Um, you had purple, which was a Yes sword, and that was the black sword. And then you had blue for Hesed, red for Geburah, and lilac was kind of Malkuth and earth, and yellow as Tiferet. Now, each sword would be taken to one of the sites by its sword bearer, and the reason for doing this was to download the colour and uh, to down download part of, the s part of yourself as well into the land to kind of put part of yourself into it. And my first seventh sword uh, took place in 1993, where I was uh, backing up one of the sword holders because each each sword holder at the time had someone else, which would also sort of help push that energy through them. Now, it started, each one started off at a place called the Cider Mill in Whiteleaf Doak, which is a, a little ruined building on the side of sort of one of the you know. Uh, part sort of halfway up, up, you know, sort of a slope almost. And uh, this is the millstone here in the middle of the, uh, uh, the cider mill, which is still exists there today. And these three things you can see around the outside are the three keys of balance, which uh, came out as part of quests of th um, uh, found by, by Debbie as things have gone along. And this was thought as, as a way to kind of open things up. Um, so the opening ritual was actually done um, at the time by uh, Steve, the late Steve Wilson um, using the sort of lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram and sort of, you know, general sort of Western ceremonial magic, but uh, it seemed to work. Um, so I was approaching with everyone else the, uh, the cider mill for the first time and uh, as we were getting there, um, uh, Debbie, obviously, who has been talked a lot about a lot today, very, very talented, extremely talented psychic, I mean, and uh, said, there's something not quite right here. And uh, she said, I can see this, you know, sort of, it's like a worm or a snake or something moving around a stone in the cider mill, you know, and we need to sort of sort this out, you know, before we go, you know, sort of start the, uh, the ritual. So I thought, oh, okay, this is a, you know, a bit of a weird starter. Um, so... She's sort of scrabbling around in the dirt, digging down at the side of the, uh, the, the, the mill wheel here, and lo and behold, produces this turquoise stone, which at the time she pulled it out, actually had a physical live worm crawling around it. 
I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. And then, after basically starting there and uh, uh, with the first sword, the second site and the kind of the first site proper after they're opening the temple um, is this place, which is uh, the door into a holy well, um, which um, was didn't used to have a padlock on it. And this is actually a later picture, which I'll, I'll come on to uh, where this one comes from later. But I said I've had to improvise a little bit with some of the photographs and do things to represent things which aren't necessarily exactly correct, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, it could be attributed to St Anne this well, we're not really, really sure. But this was, it certainly has a white lady ghost uh, connected with it and it's known sort of locally as the lady well. And this was the blue energy that we would download here through the blue sword. And I have to say, I mean, if you go and you sit, uh, I mean, when we first went there, this was not padlocked. We were actually able to open the door and actually get into the sort of the, the well house bit itself. But even when you sit on the outside, it is an incredibly magical place. The, the, the sound of the water is like voices. If you get into a meditative state, you can just hear the water speaking to you. It's an absolutely fantastic place. And then we moved slightly further on to the third site, which is, uh, and again, this is taken from the first Seventh Sword ritual, which I wasn't at, uh, but this is the, the field or orchard, otherwise known as the light place, uh, which again was going to be uh, um, another sword site, which this, this was going to be the one which the green energies would be downloaded through. And then we get this one. Um, so for those all out there looking very, very confused, I probably ought to explain why um, I have a picture of Dave Keir, uh, otherwise known as Northern Comedian Charlie Chuck on the screen. Now, both my cousin and myself were very, very big Reeves and Mortimer fans. And uh, we discovered that uh, Charlie Chuck, who, who plays a character, I don't know, some of you might know it, Uncle Peter, um, on, on the show, or did do, when, when, uh, when it was on, um, uh, had this catchphrase, um, and my first backing up of a sword was going to be the dark place. And when I heard it was the dark place, I thought, oh, it sounds a little bit sinister, I'm not quite sure, you know, but then I just remembered Charlie Chuck's catchphrase, don't send me back to dark place. And, and that kind of lightened it up a little bit for me. Um, but just to, just to also further explain that using Charlie Chuck is not totally random, in that weirdly enough, um, the first time that Andrew uh, showed the seventh sword off in any kind of really sort of major public televised thing was on a, uh, a late night TV program, uh, a sort of a chat show uh, with a guy called James Whale. Now also on the James Whale show at the time was Charlie Chuck doing his Uncle Peter thing. So when uh, my cousin and myself found out that he was playing a show at the Army and Navy pub, which is no longer there unfortunately, in, in Chelmsford in Essex, we decided to go along. Uh, a group of us, along with Andrew and other friends, of, uh, uh, Lisa was there as well. And um, he does this bizarre comedy show, which for those of you unfamiliar with him, it, it won't make a lot of sense. It's very, very surreal. Um, but one thing he did was his own kind of weird cross between a form of divination and a zodiac called the Chuckoscope. So we're beholding this in this pub in, uh, in, um, uh, in Chelmsford. And uh, I don't know whether it was just beer flowing or what it was, but me and my cousin and others, we, we thought, this would be great to get, you know, Charlie Chuck along to a questing conference and do, you know, the Chuckoscope. I think this would be fantastic. And then 
Lisa, who was working for a local paper at the time, um, got an interview with him and then we got in contact with his management and actually booked him for a questing conference in the early 90s. And I'm not quite sure what everybody made of it. You'd got very, some very, very sensible people sitting in the audience um, as Charlie Chuck comes up on stage. And, and, and let's face it, I mean, there's been... Those of you who have been to a lot of questing conferences will probably, you know, remember that there have been some quite humorous and strange acts on. I mean, from Graham Phillips telling stories of his school days uh, to... Um, Doc Shields being completely drunk and just pointing at slides of things and going, I quested that. Um, so we've got Charlie Chuck coming up on stage, not quite knowing what to make of it. And I don't think he even quite realised what gig he was booking for. I think he thought this was going to be some kind of just comedy gig. And yeah, you know, he requested his rider, which I think was so many cans of Guinness and something else. And it all got sorted out. And he gets up on stage and does the whole chuckoscope thing, which me and my cousin were just falling about laughing as he was sort of like spinning this wheel and seeing what came up and asking people things and like, oh, what's come up for you? Oh, two apples equals three, out three lemons. Therefore, you've got to get out and meet people. You know, and you just think, what? You know, but, but it was just to totally bizarre. But as I say, that, that's, that's the reason Charlie Chuck is up there. Um, and that was basically, he represents the dark place, which is where the red sword uh, energy was downloaded. And then this next picture, pretty picture of a bridge that it is at the Knight's Pool, uh, is there because unfortunately I don't have a picture of the next site, which was the bridge. This was the site done after the dark place. Now this is a stone bridge, quite like this one, but going across a road that actually goes across to the other side. And the reason we did this was, this is where we downloaded the orange sword because this was a crossing place. This is before going over uh, the road to the other side and ascending Chase End Hill, um, which is one of two main hills in the area, along with Ragged Stone Hill, which sits across the valley from it. And this is here, is all of the swords brought together on top of Chase End Hill. Um, which is where, uh, this was the yellow sword site, but this is obviously was, was kind of the, the high place where kind of things almost finished, although I should say that during the, the other uh, Seven Swords rituals that I was part of, because um, uh, they finished in 1998, it was, you know, there was going to be seven rituals done between 1992 and 1998, and that was going to be, you know, the, the sort of the finish of it. Um, the sites did change somewhat. They were a little bit mutable, but as I say, you know, the dark place, the reason I haven't got a picture of it is because it was one of those places which was, it was almost found by kind of intuition in the woods. It wasn't a fixed spot like the top of the hill and the bridge and things like this. Um, as I say, Chase End Hill, this is where the yellow uh, sword, obviously very solar, very hilltop sort of energy was downloaded. And then this is, again, back at the cider mill, um, various people there, that's Steve Wilson, oh, sorry, Steve Wilson there doing, a, the, doing the closing ritual here. Um, and this is where the, the, the purple sword energy was downloaded. Now... During the coming years, uh, between 94 and 98 inclusive, the, although the, we always went to White Leaf Oak and the Cider Mill and the Hill and all of these other sites stayed as a, a, as a constant, the ritual itself evolved. Um, it became more and more sh shamanic in sort of approach, kind of gradually the sort of... Uh, the Christian imagery was kind of stripped back a little bit and it became a little bit more uh, shamanic and intuitive rather than set to any one kind of uh, uh, religious or magical system. Um, so, did it work, the ritual? Well, at the end of the day, we don't really know whether it worked in the way we intended. We downloaded, obviously, the energies into the sites and the parts of ourselves as, as was intended. 
and nothing bad seemed to happen. But certainly there were a number of other events which came off the back of doing these rituals. Um, just one I'll quote for you. I mean, I think it was around 1995, 1996. I mean, uh, uh, I can't remember the exact year, but um, uh, Caroline Wise, who was uh, with us on obviously a large number of these, um, felt that we should pay the workers at the cider mill that year and sort of take them some apples and do things like this. And lo and behold, when she got home, um, she had an apple, a druid penny, which she was in her back garden, literally saw it fall out of midair, hit the ground, and it was like, here's your change. You've got back now, you paid the mill workers, now this is what you're getting back. So as I say, even though there's no tangible uh, evidence to suggest that, you know, oh, this has happened directly as, as a result of the rituals we did, there was a lot of other things that, that went on around it which suggested that we were definitely doing things on the right track. Now, as I say, the last uh, Seven Swords ritual, or Form of the Lamb ritual, uh, was conducted in 1998. Um, in 1999, still things went on, but uh, we were down in Cornwall basically for the, uh, the, the solar eclipse. But in 2017, um, the group of us, or you know, the main people that were that were left anyway, as sadly a lot of people have now uh, passed on. Certainly, as uh, Colin Patton, as uh, Andy said earlier, and Steve Wilson, there and a number of others are no longer with us or not part of the group. But we decided to revisit in 2017, and this is uh, Boyd Lee's in 2017 again. Uh, looking at the uh, the millstone in the centre of the uh, uh, the cider mill, and again we did uh, a group of rituals, but again not at the not all round the seven sites again. That 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 was done, but this was purely a more shamanic uh, basis, um, and uh, this really represents that. This is a picture of the uh, Denisova cave, which uh, I nicked off of Andy's site. I haven't told him that yet. But <laughs> um, and uh, we, we were looking into this whole swan line of ancestry, which obviously Caroline has been talking about through this swan and deer mothers, Iluana, the mother of light. And uh, it was, you know, evolved to this more shamanic approach. It wasn't a ritual which was stayed. It was something which carried on. And uh, this is uh, all of our number uh, posing as our sort of uh, farewell work to White of Eco at the end of that. And uh, with that, I haven't a clue how long I've been talking for, but that's me lot. <laughs> Thank you very much.